bien, buenos días a todas y a todos. Es un orgullo para mí darles la bienvenida a la sustentación doctoral de la ingeniera Ángela Castillo Aguirre. Eh, el tema de la tesis doctoral de Ángela eh, hoy en día está en la boca de todo el mundo. Todos hablan de la inteligencia artificial generativa y de las maravillas que está haciendo en nuestro mundo real. Sin embargo, mucho antes de ChatGPT, antes aún de la pandemia, en esa prehistoria, Ángela ya estaba enfocada en eh, la complejísima tarea de generar datos a través de la inteligencia artificial de manera que sean útiles en el mundo real. Ese fue el gran reto que Ángela eh, decidió abordar hace eh, ya casi seis años y eh, pues el día de hoy estamos culminando ese proceso, por lo tanto pues es para mí un inmenso orgullo eh, haber llegado hasta acá. Eh, ingeniera Castillo, tendrá usted entonces eh, entre 40 minutos y una hora para exponer los principales resultados de su trabajo de investigación, después de lo cual eh, pasaremos a una entrevista abierta con los jurados. Muy bien. Es tuyo, ¿eh? Okay, so, um, hi everyone, thank you so much for coming here today. I'm very excited to present you my PhD dissertation, um, the, the, the thesis, the thesis, sorry, <laughs> the dissertation of my thesis. Uh, it's entitled Generative Artificial Intelligence. I am um, advised by, by Professor Pablo Arbeláez and the members of the uh, committee are uh, Dr. Alita Bet, Dr. Andres Romero, and Dr. Luis Felipe Giraldo, who are all here today. Um, so to start, I would like to um, walk you through, well, actually show you what we're going to go through today. So the first thing that I will do is, of course, introduce um, all this topic and what's uh, going on here on generative AI. Then I'm going to talk about uh, four different projects that have been working, different solutions that we propose. First is um, on generalization. The second one is on temporal consistency. The third one is on efficiency. The fourth is on scalabil scalability. And finally, I will conclude with some um, final remarks. Um, okay, so let's get started. To start, I would like to, uh, I would like you to, uh, yeah, uh, understand what is going on on data generation. So here is just one example of a very popular method. This is from MetaAI. And what they are doing here is that they are uh, producing images based on text. This is very common nowadays. We see this like every single day on ChatGPT and other tools. Um, but there are some other ways we can use these generative models. So for instance, here they are uh, creating 3D models based on, te uh, on text. And this is very uh, uh, innovative. Uh, well, actually it has been very innovative Thank for the last couple of years. Uh, wait, let me mute someone. All right. Um, yeah, this has been very innovative for the last couple of years. But of course, uh, images are not the only way we can use generative models. Uh, for instance, here, um, robotics and like all uh, different area uh, related to robots are also uh, starting to use these diffusion models. In this case, the task was to uh, move something uh, based on um, the generation of a, an, uh, an artificial intelligence. But the robot was tasked to do this. Um, and finally, here, I think you cannot um, listen, but anyways, uh, there are some other domains that uh, even are outside of um, um, images or robotics, for instance, audio. 
So in this case, they were uh, generating uh, audio based on based on uh, generative models. So this is just for you to know, like there are many uh, applications and many many ways we can use generative models. But what are generative models? So to start, I would like to um, tell you uh, tell you what are not uh, generative models. So we have discriminative models, and uh, in discriminative models, what we have is that we have different classes, and what we would like to do is to take features from these classes and be able to separate between uh, the different classes that are or, uh, that are part of our distribution. However, in generative models, we want to do the opposite. So that's taking uh, an, a specific class and then generating features uh, based on, based on uh, the class to be able to produce a probability that will resemble uh, somehow the characteristics of the real world data. Um, and in this way, we can generate images. This is how we do this. Now, what are the advantages of generative models? So the first one is diversity. We can um, start generating images such or data in general, such that, such that, such that we can uh, increase the diversity. But of course, this is also very useful for, uh, to do data augmentation. And we all know that we need a lot of data and a lot of images or examples to be able to um, uh, train our model. So this is very um, util. Um, also, we can model challenging scenarios with these generative models. And uh, of course, this is very useful for benchmarking. But of course, there are a lot of challenges, challenges too. So for instance, sometimes they fail failure to capture diversity. They are unstable while training. Um, it, it's required a manual labeling. And uh, it's uh, sometimes hard to balance between quality and diversity. The realism and generalization is also a big, a big challenge, and uh, the dynamic and the temporal consistency in times is not uh, very well captured. Um, the computational efficiency sometimes is is very very um, hard for for us to 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 consider in all the uh, the the power of these methods, and the scalability for multimodal generation is also very uh, intricate these days. However, this thesis focuses on the last four. So I'm going to show you different solutions that uh, tackle this. And um, the research question that we uh, propose is how can computer vision techniques leverage generative models to address challenges such as improving generalization, overcoming temporal consistency limitations, and enhancing, uh, enhancing inference efficiency and scalability. And uh, the way we solve this is through a Practical, practical applications. So on the first part, I will show you an application uh, based on super resolution for real world images. Then we're going to move towards another domain that is parametric models uh, for human post estimation. Uh, then we will see something related to efficiency in inference. And towards the end, we are going to see what is going on um, on the last, uh, um, yeah the last uh, works that are related to the scalability of uh, generative models. So to start, I'm going to talk about the generalization uh, capacity of uh, generative models using um, image super resolution. So this work was done in collaboration with KAUST and ETH, and um, is entitled Generalized Real World Super Resolution Through Adversarial Robustness. This was a work published on um, ICCB. On, um, on a workshop on, on ICCB in 2021. So just okay, I'm going to do something here, so just give me one second. Pero esto ocultar participantes en vivo. Ah, vale, oigan, un doctorado para... <risa> eh, ok, espérate, espérate. Nos radio pequeño, ocultar video miniatura. <risa> Lo siento, esto no estaba en la práctica, ok. Uh... Ok. I was saying that to start i would like you yeah to show you an example of what we are going to see through this um 
chapter of my thesis. So you can see here that we have two different uh, type of noises. Of course, you cannot see because the quality of this vitamin is super bad. But anyways, imagine with me that on the top we have a certain type of, uh, of uh, degradation and on the bottom we have another type of degradation. And these are the ground truth uh, that we are aiming to get to. And if we use the state of the art at that point, uh, we could see that there are some Thank you so much. <laughs> I don't know. Well, anyways, um, again, I was saying that uh, you can see here that we have two, uh, two different uh, evaluations for this same model. But on blue, we have the, the images that are trained and evaluated on the same data set. And on red, those images that are trained and evaluated on different data sets. Um, here is another example of how it performs. You can see that the blue frames represent the best um, uh, performance for these models and the red are not so good. So of course, this uh, poses uh, an important question. How can we design a single super resolution model capable of, capable of enhancing low quality noise images without the need of explicit noise specific training? This was our aim. And the way we did this was through generative models. So um, just let me give you a brief um, overview of how these generative models work. We have a training set that is composed by many images. Um, and the aim is to create a generator. Uh, this is an artificial intelligence that starts from noise and then produces a fake image. And then our goal is to fake the discriminator um, for it not to be able to uh, recognize the input image that comes from the training set or the input image that, that comes from the generator. And we, we do this by an extensive uh, optimization process, but the aim here is to train the generator to generate images that will resemble very well the, characteristic, the characteristics of the training set. So previous state of the art focused on uh, ways to handcraft the noise to be able to learn somehow the degradation and then introduce it to the model and be able to un yeah, like produce a method that was very, very handcrafted. And this is why I was showing you two different uh, evaluations of the set same method because they were trained on a particular type of noise. However, we wanted to remove this. Why? Because we want one model that will be able to generalize well across different type of, of noises. So for this, we use something that is called robust training. And I'm going to, again, explain you the principles of this, um, of this um, technique, training technique. So let's say that we have an image that is a panda. And we know that it's a panda because we can see it. And um, if we fit it through a network, a uh, uh, convolutional network, for instance, the confidence that it's going to give us is 77, sorry, 57% of confidence. That this corresponds to the class panda. But then I would like to uh, suggest that we're going to add a new noise that is going to go against some gradient. You don't have to understand that, but it's going to go against some gradient. Um, and this is going to give us a new panda. But you can see that the panda that we see is not, it doesn't change perceptually, right? Uh, the noise is not enough for it to change the semantic information. However, if we fit it through the same classification network, it's going to give us 99% confidence that is another class. And this is the given class that is like uh, a monkey or something. But you can see here that with a very small noise, we were able to fool the network. And this is what we call robust training. We are going to understand which are the examples that fool the network to be able to train with those. This is the, the, the main goal of this. So to this, we uh, introduce the robust training on all these optimization process. And I'm going to show you how did we do this. Mm. So to start, uh, we proposed a robust way, a robust optimization process. Uh, that is very easy, well, uh, or very, um, not easy, but very uh, simple to explain. So we use the gradient that corresponds to the opposite of the optimization process that we're doing. And with this, we do uh, iteratively so that we can uh, take the images or take the examples that are going against this, this uh, projected uh, gradient descent. And you can see on the example on the, on the purple circle that there are some very little changes. And this is what we do for a couple of iterations. 
So this is how we construct the uh, adversarial examples. And then what we do is that when we have these adversarial examples, we add them to the low resolution input image and we just feed it through the uh, generator and perform the uh, super resolution process. And this is the objective version that we are using, but the nice thing is that it works very well. I'm going to show you in a second. So we train on uh, clean images. This is a, a standard uh, data set and we evaluate it on two different types of synthetic corruptions. One is the entire data set and the other one is AIM data set. You cannot see it here, but they have different type of corruptions. Um, and to evaluate our method, we uh, measure three different metrics. The first one is the PSNR that compares the original image with, the, with, a, um, with a processed version of the image, the SSIM, which uh, actually checks the structural information between the generated and the original one, and the LPIPs, which uh, is very important for the percept to, to understand the perceptual quality uh, or similarity between the generated image and the um, original one. And you can see here that uh, there are a lot of numbers, a lot of um, things to see maybe, but we mainly focus our training on this one because this uh, metric is the one that uh, aligns the best with the human perceptual quality and the lower is better. So just for you to know, here uh, on red, you can see that our method is, is, is very good to outperform all other methods. But it's better to show you a couple of results. So again, we have different type of, of, of the rows represent different type of corruptions. And uh, I'm going to show you how is the performance of other methods. Other methods. Again, remember that the blue corresponds to the same training corruption and red corresponds to different corruption. And here you can see on green, that is our method and it's a uh, train on adversarial um, corruptions. Something important is what, that we only have one method. We were not training on that particular noise and we are able to um, yeah, outperform the previous state of the art that require a specific uh, uh, training. And here is another example. example. Oh, excuse me. Wait, wait, sorry. Um, here's another example of a real world data sets. So you can see again, this is the same nomenclature, but I want to, uh, uh, yeah, to have your attention here. For instance, the method that was trained on this particular data set is not able to generalize well to other type of corruptions or other type of data sets. So with these, the contributions are that we are able to produce a novel method that uh, uses adversarial attacks for real world super resolution and we created a generalized real world super, resolu super resolution method without a uh, fine tuning or uh, yeah being specific to uh, being specific to a, a corruption so this was the first chapter of my uh, thesis i didn't tell you but at the end i'm going to take the questions um so the second part of my thesis is the temporal consistency. And in this case, we're going to see something completely new. Uh, we're studying human motion. This project is entitled Body Fusion, Diffusion and Sparse Obser Observations for Full Body uh, Human Motion Synthesis. And this was in collaboration with um, the Normandy University in France and MetaAI in Zurich. Um, and this was published on ICCV. Uh, well, on a workshop on ICCB 2023. So the motivation here is, uh, well, we have these virtual reality systems that are very, very interesting and uh, are very, very uh, common these days, but they have an interesting challenge. The challenge here is how can we reconstruct the lower uh, poses? Why? Because you can see here on, on the red uh, boxes that we have only a sparse uh, signal. So that is this, the signal that is from the head and from the wrists. And the aim of what we want to want to mm, propose is how can we reconstruct the whole uh, motion? So this is our goal. How can we uh, reconstruct the motion based on these spark tracking signals? And uh, this is very important nowadays for, again, all those the virtual reality systems that are very, very common. And of course, the metaverse and all of that um, um, yeah, makes this very, very um, appealing. So previous state of the art were very uh, good uh, at some point at generating this uh, motion, but they were not good enough because it was not smooth. The, the motion they were producing was not smooth. 
So of course, these uh, uh, compromises a lot the the usability of the methods, and of course, since we have the the tracking signals from the head and the wrists, uh, the lower body uh, is very very hard to to reconstruct. So our goal is to be able to reconstruct human uh, pose, uh, human poses uh, in sequence. But with this, we're going to use another type of generative models that are called diffusion probabilistic, diffusion diffusion probabilistic models or DDPMs that you're going to see those uh, letters um, later. So, sorry for 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 explaining this, I would like you to think on which is the path. I already showed you, but which is the path that we should follow to start from that uh, structure um, object to uh, something noisy. Of course, I already show you, but uh, we need to start moving the the, the dots it, for it to become something that has no 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 shape and it's completely noise. So this is called the forward process in these TDPMs models, and um, we are seeing here the noising steps. Now I would like you to think: what should we do to start from this noise and then eventually get to the point in which we have? Um, a structure uh, that is similar to the original one. So this is what we call the reverse process. And uh, here you're seeing the denoising steps. And this is important because I'm going to say that work um, through my presentation. So um, we are, of course, going to focus on how we can do uh, denoising steps and how we can we can uh, train generative models to do these denoising steps to start from pure noise and progressively a move towards something more clean. And this is uh, where we train the AI. So for body fusion, this is the overview, and this is what we propose. Again, we start with noise. You can see there that we are uh, starting with humans that are not very, uh, well, they, are, they, they, have, they have no real poses, let, let's say. Um, and what we do is that we condition this on a novel way to be able to take the, tra the tracking signals from the wrists and the head that I just mentioned and combine them some in some way that uh, could eventually help us to do the, um, well, actually to produce the, the, the full body motion. So with this, we, we train this denoise infusion that is based on the models that I just showed you on diffusion models. In this case, we use uh, those models that were, were based on, on transformers, and we produce relative uh, rotations per joint and absolute positions. Now, since we're using these humans that you can see there, um, these are parametric models. So with these two outputs, what we do is that we take them and uh, use them or on our parametric model to generate full body motion sequences. And you can see here that we are uh, generating full, full, full uh, sequences, like motion is what, what I want to say. And uh, it's very interesting because, as I show you in the uh, uh, first picture of the noisy, um models, uh, we start from something really noisy and we progressively start cleaning, 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 cleaning the motion um, to end up with a clean version of that sequence motion. And it was, well, actually, when we got these results, it was very shocking because these models work very, very well. So the experimental setup for this is that we use the AMAS data set. This is a very large data set that is well used on this area. Um, again, this uses parametric models that are called uh, SMPL. And uh, in this case, we were using 41 frames just for, for being comparable with previous state of the art. We train for 1,000 steps. And at inference, we use only 50 of those 1,000 steps. We use only 50. And here are some examples of how are the, the, the motion, the movement. Um, of these days. So again, to actually prove that we are a, a having good results and good performance, we measure the jittery. That, of course, may, tells us how smooth is the movement. We measure three different things, uh, the velocity error, the position, positional error, and the rotational error um, that tell us how well is the, the, the movement in general terms. Um, we have here something interesting, and is the hand uh, post uh, positional error, the upper positional error, and the lower positional error, which focuses on the upper uh, part of the body of, or the lower part of the body, and of course the hands. And we also propose a new metric that is foot contact accuracy that assesses the walking of a pattern of, of a person. So again, with this, we are going to see a lot of numbers. Uh, 
sorry, sorry, sorry. But um, you can see that body fusion actually outperforms previous state of the art uh, in all of these metrics. We wanted to mainly focus, since we are talking about uh, temporal consistency, where we, we wanted to highlight how well we improved the jitter and the velocity error. But again, this is for interesting when we see some uh, qualitative examples. So for instance, here you can see that we have different uh, poses and different single frames and a uh, body fusion actually outperforms previous state of the art. Uh, the red represents the high error, the blue represents lower error. And uh, since we're talking about temporal consistency, of course, uh, it makes sense to show you a video of how this performs. So, uh, you can see here on blue that is, is the ground truth, the, the, the thing that we want to get to. And uh, body fusion actually performs really, really well on for, uh, this, this uh, pose was very hard because it was sitting and you can see that there is no chair. So the model had to be able to, um, to generate, generate the, the pose of sitting. So the contribution for this chapter is that we propose a full body pose method based on diffusion models. Um, the, the, our method actually presents a novel way to understand this and actually to combine this special temporal uh, conditioning. And um, our model outperforms previous state of the art and we also propose new metrics in which we also uh, outperform previous state of the art. So that is the um, conclusion for the second chapter of my thesis. Now we're moving towards something different. And with this, um, it, well, actually this, this uh, move from diffusion models uh, from motion to something uh, related to efficiency was very important for me because I we struggle a lot training on 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 generative models, um, well, and on DDPMs that were um, that needed a lot of of resources. Uh, so in this in this case, we focused on efficiency, particularly on efficiency. And um, you can see that we use the same models, but in this case, we wanted to make them faster. Um, this work is a adaptive guidance training free acceleration of conditional diffusion models. Again, this was uh, done in collaboration with MetaAI, the NCAUST. And this is currently under review. All right, so here is the goal of what we want to do. Here is the goal of what we want to do. So um, yeah, the, the first thing that I have to say is that we save 25% of the total number of function evaluations without compromising this uh, image quality, but this is how it looks like. So let's say that we have a baseline that is on the, on the middle that corresponds to a method that uses 40 NFEs. So this is the number of function evaluations. And on the, on the left, we have the a performance of our method, which only uses 30 NFEs. And on the right, we have the classifier free guidance, which is another way to save naively the, um, the NFEs. But you can see that it compromises a lot the structure and the semantic um, information of the, of, the, of the input. So on top, we have the caption that we were aiming at. And you can see that um, um, AG, adaptive guidance, that is our method, um, actually performs really, really well. But what is it? So to start, I need to explain a little bit what is classifier free guidance. Let's say that we start not only from noise, as I showed you in the beginning, but we also have a, no, a way to condition this, in this case, is text. So we have the text that is going to be used on different evaluation, um, evaluation evaluations of our, of our uh, network, in this case, it's called unit, and at the end, we're going to get a clean version of the image. So again, this is a progression, progressively uh, diminishing. This is the, the, the output of that network we're going to call uh, epsilon t. But classifier free guidance is a way to combine this epsilon theta in a very interesting way. So I'm, I'm going to show you how. The network is going to give us two different outputs. That same unit is going to give us two different outputs. One corresponds to a conditional a prediction, and another one corresponds to an unconditional prediction. Now, what is interesting is that classifier free guidance combines these two um, predictions of the network in this way. And this is very uh, well known and very well used, but I don't know if you can see from this, but 
uh, to use classifier for guidance, we need two different evaluations of the network, while well, uh, if we use only the conditional prediction or only the unconditional prediction, we only use one evaluation. So I would like you to think this or associate this to a cost. The, um, the conditional and unconditional cost one and the classifier for guidance will cost us two. And we wonder how can we accelerate inference in such an effective yet extensive methodology? Well, to do this, we uh, studied the optimization process of uh, the denoising through something that is called neural architecture search. And the idea of this neural architecture search is that based on different options, the network, well, the, the optimization process in this case, is going to choose which is the path that should uh, select out of the options that it has. Again, remember, we have one NFE, one NFE for conditional and unconditional, and two NFEs for the classifier free guidance. And we're going to enable this through something that we call alpha, that is just a parameter uh, where we um, enable the, the back propagation. So we're going to optimize those alphas. And here's an example of how, it, of how it works in three different steps. So we have the unit steps on the bottom. And if we optimize this, we eventually get to a point in which this is going to give us the path that we should follow to optimize, um, yeah, to retrieve the result that better optimizes this system. Now, uh, the experimental setup for this is that we train on one single model, LDM 512, and we tested on different models, FM, um, LDM, EMU, and XDSL, different resolutions too, to show the generalization capacity of our, our method. We use a solver that is the function that is in charge of uh, solving the equation that is behind this, uh, that is called DDPM++ with 20 steps. And the training objective, this is your objective of the optimization that we are trying to aim at, is to replicate the full classifier for guidance model. And here's an example of not three, as I showed you previously, but 10 steps. And here is what happens, that uh, we start seeing a very particular um, way or a very particular path that this optimization follows. So we realize, we check a lot of examples and we realize that this uh, search undercovers something really, really interesting. And is that towards the uh, first steps of the denoising process, process uh, the model chooses to use classifier free guidance, but towards the end, it doesn't matter. And it actually uh, starts using uh, way more the unconditional or the conditional, um, the unconditional conditional predictions of the network. So with these results, what we did is a study that is called a cosine similarity analysis that actually measures how aligned are those vectors because we are working on a vectoral space and we can see how, the, how correlated are, are, are them um, through time. And we realize that as we, as we saw the denoising process, they became very, very aligned. And you can see here that it actually, um, um, generalizes to all the models that we tested on. We only train on one, but we tested on different and we uh, were able to see this very interesting pattern. So with this, we, uh, we propose adaptive guidance, which is a way of saying, okay, we're going to use the classifier free guidance up to one point, And then after that, we're going to use only a conditional prediction that um, uh, the network is going to give us. Why? Because we see that Towards the end, it's not necessarily to use uh, the whole classifier for guidance that is going to cost us two um, a prediction from the unit, but we're only going to use the one that contains the condition. And uh, here are some results of that. So you can see that each row, uh, sorry, each column represents different uh, type or, or different uh, costs. So the first one, 40, 32, and 30. And on the uh, last column, what we can see is the comparison, a uh, closed version of the comparison of the previous one. So that's 30 NFTs. And you can see on top that is our method and on the bottom that is the classifier free guidance, uh, saving NFTs in a naively way. We are able to maintain the details and we are able to maintain the structures and we don't compromise the, 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 the semantics of the, or the image, or of the images or anything like that. Here is another application. So this is a negative prompt. Um, we have a, a initial prompt and then we remove something. And you can see that again, a, um, adaptive guidance is able to 
safe NFEs without compromising the, the quality. We also tested this on image editing. And again, we saw the same pattern that we are able to, to save NFEs. So with this, we propose a method that is plug and play for acceleration of classifier free guidance. We achieve 50% of the gains of guidance distillation, which is another method. And uh, this is training free. We can handle negative fronts and image editing. So this was very nice because we were able to um, produce a method that was efficient, at least um, uh, for, for inference. But that is enough because many models are already trained on very la large data. And uh, the inference is a big thing to, 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 yeah, to pay attention to in terms of efficiency. But because we were seeing all these big methods, and actually they are very popular nowadays, I want to talk about the scalability of large language models that I think we all know at this point. Um, and in this particular uh, uh, chapter of my thesis, I'm going to talk about next token generation, which is what is hot nowadays. To this, I present track. Uh, this is a transformer-based rendering for unified te text-to-image creation through knowledge distillation. And again, this was this in collaboration with Kaust and Meta AI. Sorry, I'm getting. <clears throat> all right, so I think that we all know what is ChatGPT, but let's say that um, ChatGPT is a very useful um, model, a very useful system that um, actually works very, very nicely to understand the language that we, um, that we speak, basically. So uh, let's say that I ask something to ChatGPT. In this case, I'm going to ask it to explain superconductors. And this is the answer that ChatGPT gave me. Superconductors are material that, yada, yada, here and there. The important thing here is that ChatGPT is, is a model that understands or processes language. And it processes very, very well. You can see that from a very short sentence, it was able to um, retrieve the information that I needed related to, in this case, superconductors. And um, here is a, a close version of what is going on here. When I ask ChatGPT what are superconductors, this is what it does. It generates in a sequential way. So it uses the tokens. So each one of, uh, of these um, boxes represent a token and it uses previous tokens to be able to uh, produce what is going uh, next. And this is what we call next token prediction because it is uh, based on previous one, but it produces one by one. Again, this is always, always sequential. One to the other, to the other, to the other. And this is important, why? Because this is a very, um, yeah, this was the main the main observation that uh, helped us to uh, solve this question. How can we, uh, how can the integration of LLMs and DDPNs enhance the text to image generation process by incorporating progressive denoising, leading to coherent and detailed image synthesis? This is the question we pose based on how can we uh, combine, let's say, LLMs and DDPMs and create something, something new. And I'm going to ex explain you a little bit uh, more what we did. But wait, let me, okay, yeah. So there is a popular model now that uh, came out, I think it was four months ago or five, five months ago, that is called large world model. Not language model, but world model, and I'm going to explain you why. Let's say that we have this video of this puppy and we would like to ask something about this video. Well, actually, we're going to ask what is this video about? And we're going to ask this to a single model. That is this large, large word model. Now, for large word model to be able to um, process this video, it going, it's going to take an image encoder for the images and a text encoder for the text. And it's going to give us some tokens that is the same boxes that I showed you uh, before. And um, those are going to be for images or text. And after feeding it through the large word model, it's going to give us some 
tokens for images or for uh, or, or for text, but at the end they're going to it is going to give us the answer to that question based on the uh, images. You can see here that the world corresponds to analyzing both text and images uh, in a single model. Again, this is the diffusion uh, models that I, I just showed you, but I just want to highlight something interesting here, and is that for these uh, models to work, we have the, the progressive steps, but this is the decoding of these progressing steps. So these are the images that these progressing steps are going to give us, and um, these are important, why? Because these are the, the, the building blocks of our model. But I just wanted to show you how it starts from noise and it progressively starts improving to uh, correspond to the input uh, condition that we have. Um, and we propose truck. So basically truck is, it builds upon the, the large word model. But in this case, we wanted to combine the power of the large word model with the diffusion models. And this is how we do that. So again, let's say that we have some text and our aim is to generate the diffusion steps of this text uh, that come from the diffusion model. So you can see here that the text uses the, the, the text encoder uses the text and we encode each individual image through the uh, image encoder to track. Our aim is to generate the next frame. So I'm going to go back and I show you the diffusion process. Um, you can see here that we have different frames. Just as in the beginning, I showed you the video of the puppy. We're going to treat each step of the denoising process as a frame of a video. And this is how we uh, generate the next image tokens uh, for the next frame. Now, let me, let me explain you how images can become uh, tokens. Why? Because for uh, sentences or, or, or language, it's easy to, to associate one word to a token. But here is how they do this for, um, for images, how we do this for images. So let's say we have an image of a puppy. We encode it with an encoder. We have a feature map that is, um, it, it has some structure and we can quantize it. The important thing of the quantization process is that we're going to assign one number um, to each, um, to, each um, to each part of this feature map. And this number is going to become our image token. Now, in the particular uh, scenario of large word model, it generates images token by token. What does it mean? Well, let's say we have, again, some text and some image. We're going to encode it through the text encoder, image encoder, and this is going to give us single tokens and so on for uh, the next, for producing the next uh, frame. And this is, this is a little bit hard. What, why? Because the tokens are not going to give us, well, since we're trying to generate a structure or a complete frame, each token is not going to give us enough to understand what is going on on the image. And we propose here to use something, a technique that is called parallel decoding. You can see here that on the top, we have the tokens treated for text as single unit, but then for a complete frame, we're going to treat them as um, all the tokens, well, or we're going to process them, sorry, as all the tokens that correspond to that particular frame. This is uh, what we call parallel decoding, and this is very important because in this way we were able to produce both text and uh, images, but uh, the images were specialized on, on this way of decoding multiple tokens at a time and not token by token. Now, related to the implementation details of this part, we use a model that I already um, mentioned, that is XTSL. This uses, again, the DDPM solver uh, plus plus with 20 denoising steps. Now, something important here is that you can see the 20 denoising steps that it takes the model to generate the final in, uh, output based on that input. But what we did was taking not all these steps, but subsample them. Um, so in the beginning, we used the first five st steps, and then we uh, chose every three frames to complete 10 steps. 
So you can see here that we're going to use not all the complete 20 steps, but just a subsection of this, because this is important for the results later. We created a data set that is based on lava captions, and we train on eight um, RTX uh, GPUs over 20 iterations, and this actually took us like 36 hours of, or something like that. Um, actually, our training is a, uh, is a fine tuning, so it's a, um, it's a model that was uh, pre-trained on something else. So here on the top, we have the caption, and uh, what we show here is the performance of the uh, track model compared to the baseline. So XTSL is the baseline, and you can see that it starts from noise and it progressively um, cleans to reach to X0 based on the caption, and track does something very, very similar. So you can see here, you can start seeing, seeing here that um, actually trucks maintains the, the structure up to some point, and then towards the end, it starts focusing on the, on the details. But again, we're only using 10 steps. Here are more examples, and I hear these captions are very long. So I wanted just to highlight some couple of things. Um, we have XDSL, which is our, our um, upper bound, LWM, which is the method that we're comparing uh, against, and track model. Uh, so for instance, here, uh, the large uh, body of water uh, is maintained um, on, on the three setups. The buildings on the, on the background, uh, they're there too. The black and white uh, style is also maintained, but I want to highlight the part of the boats because I don't know if you can see here on track that we have a boat or a structure that uh, resembles very well the structure of a, of a boat. XDSL of, of course has it, but LWM not necessarily uh, maintains the semantic information of these captions and we are able to. Here is another example. And the, actually this is very interesting because these lava captions are very rare in the sense that for instance, it's asking uh, to generate a wooden mill, a windmill with green field, but then at some point it says the black and white image. So it's interesting because the XDSL model is able to generate the windmill in a black and white setup, but the field is green, just as here you can see in the caption. LWM is not able to capture that information from the, from the, from the caption. So it was really interesting because we are, you can see here that we have the green field and we have the, the structure of the windmill too. So this was very nice because we showed that our method is able to understand language and it doesn't lose this uh, capacity with a fine tuning. Here's another example just for you to, to see how uh, it can vary from, from, from method to method. Again, there's a residential city street, the park, cars, the trees, they are all here on the, on the scene. This is just a proof of concept, and here are just some metrics that I wanted to, to, to put into your consideration, because since this is only a, um, a proof of concept, still the metrics do not show the, the great performance of truck. So you can see here that the FID is better the lower, uh, so LDM, LWM sorry, uh, has the lower FID, and the clip score is better the higher, and you can see here that truck um, has the best um, um, clip score, but it's comparable against um, other state of the art, in this case, LWM. To finalize, uh, the contributions for this is that we leverage upon these large word models to be able to generate um, image, text to image based on this diffusion model knowledge. And we can integrate very well these uh, big UGAN representations too. Um, to, to understand and actually to, to, to generate um, coherent images based on LLMs and DPMs. And now to conclude, sorry, I am just going to go very, very fast through the conclusions. Um, we, we, we talked about the generalization capacity of generative models, and here we show the, the power of these models to reconstruct uh, images uh, for super resolution, super resolution tasks. Um, we also show the temporal consistency can be leveraged with these diffusion models uh, for progressive human, uh, yeah, human post estimation. We then moved towards um, um, 
improving the efficiency in terms of the classifier free guidance and all this uh, way of generating images based on text. And at the end, we merge these uh, diffusion models with LLM to generate images based on next token prediction. Now for the future perspectives, I believe that these uh, generative models are of course going to uh, be more and more popular on our, on our society. So it's very important to have this in mind and to keep this in mind because it's important to understand what are these methods. Uh, as I would define them is that they are tools and since they are tools, it's important to use them correctly and use them uh, wisely, let's say. Um, you can see here that there are many, many ways of combining different types of, 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 of uh, information. It could be images, it could be text, it could be video, um, and we can, we can generate unified models. Um, and this is actually uh, what I have here. We can process and, and generate um, different uh, ways of, of, of understanding the world, let's say, through uh, the combination of this uh, uh, multimodal data. Here is the list of publications, and this is where I uh, get nostalgic. Here is the list of publications that were derived from this PhD thesis. Here are a couple more. And of course, sorry, of course, I don't know what is going on. This is the most important. Uh, of course, this is uh, not done. not done only by me, but by the people who has been supporting me through this very hard path. My family, my friends at DCV, and many other people who are not here, but they are here in my heart. And of course, Pablo, thank you so much for uh, I always say that Pablo saw something in me that I couldn't see. And then I still need to work on seeing, but thank you. Thank you so much for, for your help and support. And of course, it wouldn't be me if I didn't give you my personal take of what is doing a PhD. So this is just what I want to leave you. And it's that don't give up. Failure is part of the process and it's important to understand that. Often the way we see progress is to stop and look back in hindsight because hindsight is always 2020 and God and life itself will ensure that the reward arri arrives exactly when it's meant. Thank you.